My name is Richard Manser and the business is Five Star Windows and Conservatories. We're a sales and marketing operation really that supplies and fits uh, windows, doors, conservatories and the associated products uh, in that marketplace really. How would you describe your marketing approach? It's 75% online and 25% offline. Mm -hmm. I would say it's quite forward thinking in terms of as an example, we 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago, we were starting to buy leads off the internet, off companies that were generating the lead. Um, whereas I think in the last three or four years, everybody's jumped onto that bandwagon, but three or four years ago, we started generating our own leads. Uh, and to date, we don't buy any leads off the internet. We produce our own leads on the internet. And everybody else is trying to do all the old fashioned things and they're scrapping around, trying to buy these leads off various lead providers like um, Quote Artists, uh, Leads for You, Leads to Trade and so they're all fishing in the same pool, scrapping over each other, these leads get resold whereas we were doing that 10 years ago when they were a lot cheaper and capitalised on it, spent £20,000 a month just buying leads off the internet and so we got to know what worked, what didn't work and we've now started generating leads ourselves mm. and so I think we're kind of um, very proactive, forward thinking on that side of it and um, we're doing less and less of the old fashioned methods. Some of the most effective aspects of your marketing, some of the most uh, effective decisions you've made with regards to marketing? To move online, I think, okay. to move away from the newspapers. Yeah. As hard as it is to be in the, like, the glossy magazines, for example, one of the, um, as an entrepreneur, business owner, you get yeah. bombarded with people trying to sell you advertising space, and it's very easy to say yes to things and to not think about the numbers and the mechanics. It's very easy to be proud almost and think, oh yeah, I want to be on the front of Worcestershire Life, but I'm going to have this back page of Worcestershire Living, you know, because it's, it's £1,200, but oh, it's a real nice glossy book. But actually, if you looked at the figures, and I can remember from when we were doing, it used to be Worcestershire Life, Worcestershire Living, 24-7 magazine, various different formats, you know, we might get one or two leads a month that we could attribute to that because you can't always track every single lead because some people just walk into a show and they don't give you general information. But we record every single conversation. Mm. Is one marketing method we use as well. So we, we, we check and double check and triple check almost. We ask when the reps fill the form in, they have to put where it came from. But um, so one of the things I've learned is that if say it costs 1200 pounds to do that, every time now I think, well actually how many leads will I get out of that? Yeah. I might get two or three, or even if it's a fantastic month, I might get five yeah. leads. I don't think I would, but if I did get five, then they cost me 200 and something pounds each. Whereas that same spend I could put into, well, Facebook now is the very latest thing and probably get 50 leads for the same spend. Mm -hmm. So although I'd love to be on Worcestershire Life and on every coffee table in all these AB1 homes, Actually, I'd like to spend that 1,200 quid and be in front of, yeah. you know, 20,000, well, I think it's 26,000 people in the last three days of seeing our advert or something. You know, I'd rather be in front of them subliminally keeping the word five star on them. So it's, it's having that ability to look at the figures and say, actually, it sounds like a good idea, but I'm not going to do that because it just wouldn't get the same bang from a book or yeah. whatever the term is. Has there ever been a time when you felt you didn't pick the right marketing approach to maybe tap into a particular Yeah, market. yeah, there's yeah, been loads, yeah. <laughs> <It's> been, <laughs> great. Um, I, uh, again, th this is a little bit about this sort of forward thinking thing and changing the marketing methods and being up to speed with things. Years ago, the Yellow Pages, for example, would have been a really good lead source. The BT phone book would have been a really good lead source. The Thompson directory. Uh -huh. And whilst they might still work nowadays, the actual amount you have to spend to get the same that you would get online would be prohibitive. But I do remember uh, doing a £25,000 radio campaign with um, Wyvern, I think it was at the time. Yeah. And we had a jingle made. It was called Price Your House with a Mouse. I was trying yeah. to, nearly 10 years ago now, I was trying to, I had a, every bit of marketing we did, we had a picture of a silly mouse on there. I had a cartoon chap who drew all this mouse on it to try and stand out and um, and he did get noticed and we had this jingle that said price your house with the mouse dot com blah, blah, blah. and when the idea was to try and get people to go online and get a quote for what they would do 
Um, it, it cost 26,000, 25, 26,000 pounds, whatever it was. Mm. It didn't actually, although the radio people would say, oh, it works, but it's subconsciously you've probably had more sales. Because we tracked the sales and we know where all the other stuff comes from, there wasn't this void of mm. money spent. So really, it might have been a little bit of a branding exercise, it may have helped slightly in the few people's decisions, but mm. if you track things consistently, oops, sorry. <laughs> and if you look at like, for example, our, uh, this is our goals in the last month, yeah. you know, how many people each day have done something on the website, you can see if there's a spike or if something's actually working. So if you look at that over a longer period of time, I could look over the last year or two years or five years or whatever. If it, suddenly you start a radio campaign at this point here mm. and things start going up, then we know something is categorically working. Yeah. Whereas if nothing really changes and the figures are the same and the sales are the same, it's not yeah. the best value for your money. So I would say the radio campaign at that time wasn't the best. Mm -hmm. uh, I also spent, uh, had the back page of Yellow Pages throughout the Worcestershire directory. And we also had to have the biggest address in the window page and the conservatory page. And all in all, I think we spent 30 odd thousand mm -hmm. within Yellow Pages, but the leads didn't, they were the most expensive leads. They worked at something like, I don't know, 500 and something pounds each, which is crazy if you think actually what you could put that money into. So I've made some uh, good mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Not mistakes, they're learning curves. Learning and, curves. Um, and it's great to look back and learn these things but What types of different market research have you conducted? I mean, you've mentioned a lot about the, I suppose, the quantitative data you, mm -hmm. you've, you've captured. Um, could you tell us more about that or any other different methods of research you've, you've conducted? Yeah, we've spoken to our own customers. Um, we regularly, um, or once a year, we ring our own customers up and we uh, speak to them to just check they don't need any service calls and things but while we're on the phone the idea is to engage in the conversation to try and get some data out of them what the customers are thinking what they're buying um, and from that conversation that gets shared um, every week with our sales manager and we start to think we see a trend if people are starting to ask about for example tiled roof conservatories at the moment is a thing people are starting to hear that all in the 90s and early 2000s, there were a massive amount of little 3x3 three three Victorian conservatories sold with free cane furniture and tiled floors and things. And whilst they seemed really good at the time, consumers suddenly found that they're great, but for about a third of the year, two thirds of the year maybe. But in the winter, they were too cold, mm -hmm. so they became a dumping ground. And in the summer, they were too hot, so they didn't really get used. Mm -hmm. Whereas now people are starting to ask about this. They've heard that you can have a tiled roof taken mm -hmm. off. So when we're ringing people at the moment, we start to hear them saying this sort of thing. So we've physically built a tiled roof conservatory in Kidderminster. We've put one in our new showroom in uh, Worcester. So mm. by listening to the consumers conducting this research, it's telling us what people are looking for. Yeah. And we see what they spend as well, because we're obviously selling, you know, mm. quite a lot of product. We find out what they're starting to order each week. So we look at our ordering patterns as well, and thinking, well, more people are starting to order grey windows, for example. Mm three or four years ago, nobody ordered a grey window unless it's you know, a commercial building or something. Whereas now a lot of domestic customers are starting to see that grey is quite a, a good uh, choice. Mm. So um, that's by looking at our own data then and by talking to customers, they're telling us things like this. Generally, what do you see as the critical roles of market research? To get meaningful data that allows you to steer your business in the right direction. Mm. Because there's, you know, there's, I think some people are quite passionate about things that they like, but it's not actually always what the marketplace wants. Mm -hmm. So I think from what I've seen is some businesses go full steam in one direction and it's not actually what the market's asking for. It's just the, the chapel lady running the business might yeah. be passionate about something, but it's actually not what the market wants. So the idea of market research is to really make sure you're on the right path, what your consumers want, or if you're whichever marketplace you're operating in. We have, the other thing we have is um, every industry generally has a trade journal and you know we have about 10, <laughs> literally there's a the glass and glazing times, the, the fenestration news, the, know, glass this, glass that, there's <laughs> loads and they all get sent through so I very often take them home because you don't have time to read them at work and you know yeah. it's a sort of sitting on the loo reading material you know <laughs> but that's market research as well and you can yeah. you know you can pick a lot up from that. You can yeah. see what people are advertising. How do you keep an eye on your competitors? How do you use 
information and research to, to track what they're doing? Um, obviously we have a sales force that are going in to um, visit consumers every day and very often they'll bring back a quote or if they very often will come back with an order and say they'll bring back somebody else's quote with them and so every week when our um, Ed, our sales manager, has his meeting, they'll gather all the information. We have a sort of spreadsheet and we'll say, well, this company looks like they've changed what they're doing because they're no longer pushing this product and they're actually saying they must buy their big product from here. Mm -hmm. So we would say, well, because the, the idea is that if I was seeing you about a conservatory or windows or something, you may say something like, well, that's great. Thanks, Rich, but I'm going to get another couple of quotes. And I might use something called a pedestal chop as a, <laughs> as a sales term, which would be to say something like, well, listen, if that's a good thing, I'd, um, my advice would be always to get more quotes. However, from what you were saying earlier, um, Helen, there might be an argument for um, using another company than the ones you suggested, because ABC company that you suggested, they're not really gonna solve your problems because they only use this. In fact, I think I've got a brochure somewhere in my bag. Here's a quote we picked up the other day, and it says they're offering the so-and-so roof. Now, from what you were saying, you wanted to use this room all year round, but this uh, company, I don't think you're using that. My advice would be to go to Fred Blogg's company, mm. because Fred Blogg's, I've got one of their quotes as well, because we often come across each other. I know they do that roof, um, so it might be good to get a quote from them. The only thing is, they're so expensive. <laughs> you know, have you seen the price of their things, you know? But you know, that's up to you. If you want to get another quote, that might be a good thing to do or whatever. And then consumers think, oh, actually that's good information. So if the rep is going out there with his market research, he knows what our competitors are selling. Yes. He can help the consumer make an informed buying decision. He can say, well, that's great. If you're buying a car, you might say, well, you could go to so-and-so, but you said you're not going to change the car. You're going to keep it for the rest of your life. But the Hyundai brand or whoever it is, they only offer a three-year warranty, whereas Kia or whoever it is you're buying from, yeah. they offer a 10-year. Now, that might be a, something you should consider, but, you know. How have you used research to kind of understand and develop the value proposition that you offer to customers? Um, I think by listening to what the customers are saying, um, we can alter things slightly. Okay. Because, um, for example, a few years ago, before these tiled roofs came out, consumers were saying they wanted a room they could use all year round. They weren't saying, we just want this extra living space. So they were saying, we want this extra living space, but actually I'd like to be able to use it more into the winter. So by getting the feedback from the customers, we went and found a product, uh, a polycarbonate at the time that was 35 millimeters thick and it had seven layers. It actually had a lower U value, which is just the way you measure heat loss. And it, it, it helped the consumers use the conservatories longer and, and that was really from listening to what they were saying so we then changed the product to suit the customer mm -hmm. so we said rather than just doing 16 mil triple polycarbonate we're now able to offer this as an upgrade because we found that a lot of people would like to use the thing all year round um, so by listening to customers in the first place it allowed us to use that product. Has um research that you've conducted ever made you reconsider anything or change direction so something that you've found out from research something that your customers have said is that made is that challenge any assumptions you have made you think about doing something differently um i'm sure it has i can't think of anything off the top <laughs> of my head at this moment but yeah. um i think it's really important to listen to what customers are saying and research yeah. um i could give you an example literally of today, it's only a daft thing, but as you know, we're building a new showroom in Worcester. Mm -hmm. And rather than, I was, we've, we've got a conservatory there that's light oak color on the outside. It's got a little tiled roof. It's for the replacement roof market. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to uh, think, because I've designed the whole thing myself really, but rather than selfishly sort of saying, I didn't know what color to have the inside window boards and I needed to take them over to the chaps who were fitting there today. And I was thinking, well, if I use white, it's completely neutral, da da da. And so I said to Leslie, who's the girl who runs the trade counter for me, what would you use? And Nigel was there, the other chap. Nigel was saying, oh, I wouldn't have light oak. Yeah, have white, it goes with everything, which is what I was thinking. And Leslie said, no, that's boring. Why don't you go for the thing? So I think by listening to other people as well, yeah. and not just going off your own views, yeah. you, you, because my thought process was then, well, Leslie's a typical consumer. 
Yes. She's probably the sort of person who would buy our conservatory. Yes. Actually, that's good to listen to her. Yes. So we'll very often put things around the office or speak to customers, to other people, not make the decisions ourselves. Yeah. So it's good to get feedback. How do you make sure that that data is reliable and valid and that you can trust that's mm. what's being generated? How, how can you, how do you ensure that it is reliable? Okay, well one thing we do is we record every call. Mm -hmm. We have um, our own phone system which we have as a company. Is um, It records every single incoming and outgoing call anyway. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we do, every marketing lead source on a different system records we have unique phone numbers so if you rang um, I don't know, if you looked at a certain page on a website it'll have one phone number if you looked at another page it has a different phone number so we know if somebody's wrong from which page on the website and that goes through a call recording system as well so it will say calls are being monitored for, for training and information purposes mm -hmm. and um, we we listen to those calls to make sure that the person speaking to them is saying the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's obviously is for training as well. So, um, so this call recording would be the main mm -hmm. method of checking that's correct. Mm -hmm. And then um, most of the people we have working for us, we do know and trust, and have worked for us for quite a few years, mm -hmm. which is important to me.